I'm Jane Davidson. Um, I'm the author of Future Gen, Lessons from a Small Country. And the book tells the story of why Wales is the first country in the world to actually put protecting future generations into law. And in doing so, became the first country in the world to actually have a legal mechanism to deliver on the sustainable development goals as well. My background uh, is in policy and strategy and young people. And I spent many years as a teacher, as a youth worker, uh, as a charity professional, and also as a minister in the Welsh Government. When people think of the UK, um, they have a very clear idea about England, because London is the capital of the United Kingdom. And they often have a really clear idea about Scotland because there's a massive dispersal of Scottish people across the world. And of course, the highest mountain in the UK is in Scotland. And um, often when I'm trying to explain to people about Wales, which is the third part of mainland UK, they have no idea where it is. So um, if you can imagine uh, a big area that is England, and then on top of that body of England, there is a, uh, a head that is Scotland. Over on the left hand side, uh, an arm reaches out into the Irish Sea and that arm is Wales. And so Wales is the smallest country in the United Kingdom. Um, it has about three million inhabitants uh, in terms of people and about 10 million sheep. Uh, it's very green. It has the second highest mountain uh, in the United Kingdom, which is called Snowdon or Arroiva uh, in Welsh. Um, it has two national languages, uh, English and Welsh. And in fact, about a fifth of the people in Wales speak Welsh as their first language. And many people don't realise that on mainland UK, there is a country in which a whole other language of an entirely different origin to English is spoken on a daily basis. And in all our schools, children learn Welsh and a third of the schools, uh, all their lessons will be undertaken in Welsh. And where I live in a, a county called Pembrokeshire on the very west of Wales, um, I live in an area where the majority of people are Welsh speaking. So Welsh language and culture is very important. I think another very important aspect of Wales is that the agrarian revolution moved to the industrial revolution and Wales was the first country to do that. So Wales was actually designated the first industrial country. It had the first million pound check signed in the coal exchange here in, and for coal. And Welsh coal is famous uh, throughout the world, but also other extractive industries, quarrying for slate, copper, iron, steel. So Wales actually became the place where it was so strong in terms of those natural resources that it became a place where its wealth was extracted and its health was extracted as well. The people of Wales are still poorer and less healthy than other parts of the United Kingdom. And despite the fact that the UK left Europe at the end of December, uh, if we were still in Europe, West Wales and the valleys would still be among the poorest parts of Europe. So we have this dichotomy whereby we have a country whose resources have been plundered for others in the whole of its history, generating massive wealth for others when that wealth did not stay in the country, but also a country that continues to have natural resources of benefit now. Uh, because of the prevailing southwesterly winds in the UK, uh, Welsh wind is incredibly important and now powers energy both for the country and beyond. Welsh seas are very important potentially in the context of new opportunities for renewable energy. Wales has a huge amount of water, rather too much actually in the last few days where we've had flooding, but Welsh water is already uh, enabling people in cities in England uh, to have uh, good quantities of fresh water. So Wales 
also with its green hills and valleys, uh, with its water, with its wind, with substantial sunshine um, in its south, southern and southwesterly parts, has enormous amount of renewable resources in terms of the next generation and tackling issues around climate change. It's a really strong country in terms of community as well. In many ways, the fact that it is a poor country like many other poor countries, a really strong sense of family, of community, of neighbourliness. And I've never been anywhere where people have cared quite so much and where people will always help if they can. It makes it the most extraordinarily wonderful country to live in because it is so physically beautiful. It was the first uh, designated area for beauty in the United Kingdom. Uh, with the Gower Peninsula, which has still got one of the most famous beaches in the in the world, uh, becoming the first area of outstanding natural beauty in the United Kingdom. And a lot of Wales, almost a quarter of Wales, is either na um, um, designated areas of, of natural beauty or full national parks because of the nature of its environment. So a small population, um, farming mostly sheep and cattle, very good at growing grass, very good at, uh, at providing renewable energy, very strong on community, and this very diverse culture linked to the language. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Wales' is nationalised Stedford is the largest celebration of a minority language in Europe, and its partner, for young people, the Year of the Nationalist at Stedford is also the largest festival for young people in Europe. So we have this tiny country on the left of Britain as that you look at the map with all these firsts in the context of its history. And those firsts have made it, I think, historically a country of ambition. The difference now is that ambition is here for the people of Wales, by the people of Wales. No longer will Wales allow its wealth of whatever to be extracted for the benefit of others. Now it's looking as a nation, and it's only been a nation in political terms uh, since devolution was granted to Wales, and it had its own National Assembly in 1999, and that has turned into a full-blown parliament last year. Now Wales is ready to utilise its resources for its own people. So in, in, in 2015, um, the National Assembly for Wales passed a Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Uh, and I was incredibly excited by this. I've been in politics in, in, in Wales, um, in the National Assembly, since its very beginning in 1999. And what was unique about Wales at the time was that when it was granted the powers to become a National Assembly in the Government of Wales Act of 1998, a unique duty was given to Wales, not to Scotland, not to Northern Ireland, which also inherited uh, their own devolution to become their own nations. Um, but very specifically, Wales was asked to promote sustainable development in the exercise of its functions. And it's quite interesting if we think about why that happened, but it's really important in looking back at, as to why Wales has a Wellbeing of Future Generations Act now. And I think in many ways, this is to do with um, the Rio conference in 1992. Because Wales has always been seen as very green, and because Wales, I think, reacting against that background of extraction of fossil fuels and um, you know, high value materials from the country, wanted to do whatever it could to sustain itself in its own environment. Actually taking a, an approach to sustainable development was really important here. And as part of the, um, the Rio 1992 agenda, there was a program set up called Agenda 21. And I think that Agenda 21 was incredibly important uh, in the context um, of the development of Wales, because 
Agenda 21, first principle said, human beings are at the center of concerns for sustainable development. They are entitled to a healthy and productive life in harmony with nature. And I remember reading this and it was just a massive epiphany for me because it was the idea that we should not extract at the expense of nature, but there was had to be an absolute acceptance that nature was absolutely critical to the survival of humans. So it wasn't the extracting that was critical, it was nature that was critical. So we needed to think of different ways to work in the context of our environment. And that vision was adopted by the members of parliament um, who influenced what became uh, the Government of Wales Act um, and therefore the beginning of the National Assembly. And the importance of that was that because Wales had this, uh, because Wales was the only country in the United Kingdom uh, for devolution to be given this duty, it meant that Wales could start to do things differently. And in, in, in essence, from the moment that the new first National Assembly uh, was elected, um, its members were charged with that responsibility. But what is really difficult, and I think is absolutely critical in the context of the journey, is what do you want to achieve? And how are you going to get there? And actually, although the National Assembly for Wales had a duty to have a scheme about how it was going to promote sustainable development and the exercise of its functions, and although the National Assembly adopted the most famous definition of sustainable development in the world, the Brunton definition, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising on the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, it's not clear what you're trying to achieve. And therefore, in a sense, the story in the run up to the well-being of the Future Generations Act is the attempt by three governments prior to that. And I was in all those governments as a minister to how were we going to do it? You know, what what was the vision? And I, I love, you know, Donella Meadows, um, who's been an absolute inspiration to me um, throughout my life. I mean, she talks about visioning as taking off the constraints of feasibility of disbelief um, and letting your mind dwell upon its most noble, uplifting, treasured dreams. And that felt to me like the challenge that we've been set as an incoming government in 1999. And how are we going to deliver on this challenge? How are we going to deliver on this duty uh, that we had been given? And it was really hard. We started by trying to encourage people to learn how to live differently. And in terms of that learning, it was thinking about how we could put sustainable development at the heart of everything that we did. And there was enormous support for the idea. But literally within those first four years, people were starting to say, well, this is too woolly. We don't understand what it means. We we can't see any way you are behaving differently as a government. So four years on, we decided to uh, have a new scheme called Starting to Live Differently, where we would create a set of individual actions which people would realise that we were moving on that kind of path. And those, those actions would be the same kind of actions as, as you'd see in any country wanting to deliver more sustainably, you know, wanting to use renewable energy more, wanting to protect nature more, changing the way that the government related uh, to its environment. But it was also a period of time where all sorts of other things happened. We had massive flooding across the country. We had foot and mouth um, disease. Uh, we had immense problems in terms of the loss of thousands of jobs working in the steel industry. And people were not prepared, understandably, to sacrifice the steel industry and those jobs. It's really important that a government is able to take its people with it. And obviously, even if you want to start to live differently, 
What you don't want to do is lose thousands of jobs and therefore put thousands of families at risk in terms of their livelihoods with the loss of, for example, the steel industry, which is still the largest fossil fuel industry left in, 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 in Wales now. When I inherited the responsibility in 2007 and became the Minister for um, Sustainability, Environment and Housing, it struck me that perhaps we needed to just take a totally new look at how we were going to deliver on this. And I thought that the best way forward was to make sustainable development the central organising principle of government. And I thought if I could do that, then actually it would be fine because people would know what we were trying to achieve. And because it was the central organising principle of government in our um, ways of working, it would mean that there would be an instruction to the civil service, those officials that support the ministers uh, in government in the UK, it would be a clear instruction to the civil service on what they had to do. And what I was delighted about at the time was that actually the process of getting it adopted as the central organising principle of government was actually relatively easy. The cabinet understood that the first two schemes had not been as effective as they would like. And the first minister, the prime minister uh, of Wales, really wanted to make this work in the interests of the government, but also in the interests of the Welsh people. And so he gave me complete support uh, in terms of driving this agenda forward. We were in coalition which meant that we were two parties in the context of government. Between us, we held somewhere um, around two thirds of the vote in the assembly. So it meant that agreeing this principle meant that I knew once it was through cabinet, I could get it through the National Assembly. So all of that happened actually relatively easy. And I remember going home after the vote in the National Assembly, absolutely delighted that now we were on the way, that sustainable development is not an option that would go away, it was the only way forward. And it turned out that actually <laughs> it needed a bit more help. I thought that when we had the cabinet agreement with the permanent secretary, who is the top person of the officials in government in, in, in the way our systems work, in the room, I thought we would now really be able to deliver on a sustainable development agenda. And I was incredibly excited about it. And civil society in Wales was incredibly excited about it. They really wanted government to deliver. They'd been haranguing government for not delivering effectively. But now we all thought that with a concept, uh, one Wales, one planet, within the lifetime of a generation, we would see Wales using only its fair share of the Earth's resources. And that's something we really, really wanted to get behind. Sadly, it was not enough. We have manifesto-led government in Wales. And although we had a cabinet decision, because it had not been a manifesto commitment, because the civil service had a very clear objective already to deliver on a coalition contract, they started adopting this as an additional approach rather than the central approach, which is what the cabinet vote had been. And it struck me, therefore, that things were not changing. The policy agenda was not changing direction in the way that it needed to. And that therefore, the aim of this huge decision was actually not being delivered. And it, it, it struck me that I needed to have an understanding from some of the key agencies in Wales about whether they were perceiving changes in behaviour. And the Wales Audit Office undertook an audit of the delivery of the cabinet ambition. And they found that 
the civil service might be telling us as ministers that this principle of sustainable development at the very heart of government was being delivered. But in actual fact, they were not in any way cascading that down the whole organisation so that the business delivery of government was not changing. What we were being told as ministers was changing, but the business delivery of government was not changing. And I think in many ways, what was really um, sad to find out was that in the whole history, the 10 years in which we had been trying to find our way into delivering on this legislation, the Wales Audit Office was able to tell us that we had never failed to promote sustainable development. So we'd never failed to deliver on that initial clause. But I don't think that anybody looking externally at Wales, in terms of all the decisions that were made in Wales, would think that Wales was very different from any other country. And I knew uh, intrinsically, intellectually, that if we were going to tackle the big challenges in front of us, how the government operated and what it decided to do had to be different from the normal decisions taken by government. So that was that was a, a real wake up call for me. The second real wake up call was when WWF, um, World Wide Fund for Nature, um, which is present in most countries in the world, uh, commissioned uh, a report from an academic to look at how well the ministers were delivering on the ambition on sustainable development. And we failed that test too. And that was incredibly disappointing, uh, particularly when I was not immune from challenge either, <laughs> which is a pretty difficult place to be in when you believe something hugely and yet you are also found wanting in its delivery. Um, and at the time, I remember being really cross with the academic, but he was absolutely right. You know, we were saying one thing, but actually our delivery was not commensurate with what we were saying. But the final catalyst uh, in many ways is an ironic one. Because the final catalyst that means that Wales now has a Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is that I'd been drawing on the immense uh, advice from the Sustainable Development Commission. It had been set up 10 years previously. Uh, it had served all governments in the UK over a range of administrations over the years. Um, and therefore, it was used to working with people of all political parties. Its, its advice was invaluable. It was absolutely based on evidence. It drew on expertise from the USA, from Germany, uh, from other parts of Europe uh, and other places across the world. It really was one of the best mechanisms for giving advice to governments about how to deliver on sustainable development. And the incoming Conservative Liberal Democrat government in 2010 removed it overnight. Now, in many ways, I think that removal was accidental because they'd come in on a manifesto of not wanting these uh, non-governmental bodies that were funded by government and pledging that for a new one to be set up, an old one had to be removed. And I think in many ways that the Sustainable Development Commission was removed because it came into that category, because there was no consultation about its removal. It was just literally removed overnight. And it struck me that having spoken at its 10th anniversary conference in a city called Bristol, which was only 45 minutes from the capital city of Wales in Cardiff, that in that train journey on the way home, I realised that if we wanted to deliver sustainable development to look after the interests of future generations, you had to rely on a strong evidence base and support. And so in many ways, it was the actions of the Conservative and Liberal Democrats that actually 
meant that I then proposed what is now the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. But it was all these things that contributed to what is in the Act, because it became really important to look at this in the context of government itself being accountable to the people of Wales in their delivery on the Act. And that's very unusual, because governments normally make Acts for others uh, to have to comply with, not itself. But it was really important to me that that was the case. It was really important to me that there should be a critical friend, um, a commissioner, who was capable of both uh, entering organisations uh, and reviewing their activities, but also generating good practice, supporting good practice, encouraging better practice. Um, because I'd had that role working alongside me all the time that I'd been there with no legislative underpinning. And I felt that if there was a legislative underpinning to a sustainable futures commissioner, that would enable the Act's delivery to be a lot stronger. I felt it should be audited in the same way as all public services are audited, so that the audit function had to change in the way that that audit operated. Because I felt that these were absolutely essential underpinnings of the Act. And finally, it had to apply to all the public services that were in the responsibility of Welsh Government. And therefore, legislation that complied with all those four areas would have the best possible chance uh, in life. And I wanted it, um, if possible, uh, to actually pick up all the learning from the previous work that had been done. In particular, the document that we published in 2009 called One Wales, One Planet, because we'd consulted upon that. We'd generated it collaboratively with civil society. We'd taken on board what the people of Wales set, said. We had young people influencing it and generated lots of a young uh, opportunities for young people to influence outcomes in Wales through becoming um, young climate activists, for example. So we felt that actually we were capturing the views of the people of Wales in that document. And I'm delighted that in many ways, uh, One Wales, One Planet is the vehicle being translated into law through the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. But if we just focus for a moment on what the Act now asks people to do, because I've said before in, 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 in what I've been saying to you today, that one of the real problems from the very beginning was that people didn't know what they were aiming for. They understood the principle. They wanted to deliver on the principle, but they didn't know what it looked like. They didn't have a what and they didn't have a how because they didn't know what they wanted to achieve and they didn't know how to get there. So it was absolutely critical that the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act should have a what and a how. And the what is seven goals. And those, these goals are actually in the legislation. So these goals are mandatory. Every single person working in a public sector organisation in Wales in the responsibility of Welsh Government now effectively has a duty to contribute towards delivering on these goals. And these goals actually demonstrate unequivocally how now there is an entirely different approach in the context of sustainable development in Wales because there is no longer an optional approach to how you achieve it. Now, if you're going to deliver on a prosperous Wales, you have to be innovative, productive and low carbon. You have to take account of climate change. You have to take account of the limits of the global environment. You have to contribute towards creating a skilled and well-educated uh, population in an economy which generates wealth and provides opportunities, allowing people to take advantage of the wealth generated through securing decent work. 
any of these words can now be challenged in law, but the intention of the goal is clear because the intention is low carbon, innovative, within the limits of the global environment, creating opportunities for decent work. And the Brundtland definition of sustainable development is at the heart of this delivery. So development that meets the needs of the present without compromising on future generations meeting their own needs is right at the heart of this legislation. So in essence, if anybody wanted to open a new coal mine in Wales, they could immediately be challenged by this legislation. The second goal is a resilient Wales a nation which maintains and enhances a biodiverse natural environment with healthy functioning ecosystems that support social, economic and ecological resilience and have the capacity to adapt to climate change. Now, what interests me here is there is no nation yet in the world that has been able to deliver on its biodiversity targets. I'd still personally prefer that this goal was called the nature goal, but importantly, it no longer thinks that maintaining biodiversity is enough. It has to be about enhancing biodiversity. So immediately we have a commitment to creating greater opportunities in the context of nature. The third goal, a healthier Wales, a society in which people's physical and mental well-being is maximised and in which choices and behaviours that benefit future health are understood. Nothing about targets in terms of delivery, in the context of sickness, how quickly an ambulance gets to a house, how quickly a patient leaves hospital, but actually looking upstream at how we create a healthier population by all those other actions, by housing, by education, by what food they eat, by the environment they live in, by the clean air by clean water, by renewable energy. So actually looking completely differently at the health agenda. The fourth goal, a more equal Wales. Now I've talked to you about how Wales is generally is a much poorer country than other parts of the UK. And therefore commitments to tackle poverty have been at the heart of every single government since the National Assembly was developed. And a more equal Wales is a society that enables people to fulfil their potential no matter what their background or circumstances, including their socio-economic background and circumstances. And I think this is an absolutely critical goal in the context of the well-being of Wales, because there have been lots of actions where governments have created projects in communities, but this is not about government creating projects. This is about a society that enables people to fulfil their potential. So very exciting ideas, for example, around a community taking control of its own resources, managing its own land use, creating its own economic opportunities. Those kinds of ideas are now being developed in many places within Wales and is a completely different way for government and society to engage with each other. And that leads straight into the fifth goal, the Wales of more cohesive communities, where the focus is on attractive, viable, safe and well-connected communities. And that connected, it could be about broadband because Wales has yet to, to be digitally covered. It could be about public transport. It could be about a combination of digital use of electric vehicles. It could be about what viability looks like, new ways of looking at town centres, new transport systems, but also new foundational economy opportunities to create more opportunities for the local pound to circulate in communities. And only two weeks ago, a new virtual currency was launched to help top up local communities here in Wales. The sixth goal is a Wales of vibrant culture and thriving Welsh language, a society that promotes and protects culture, heritage and the Welsh language and which encourages people to participate in the arts and sports and recreation. 
leisure is so important in our lives. I mean, personally, I'd love to see a u universal basic income. And I know that there are moves afoot in Wales to try and persuade governments of all political parties to look at a universal basic income, to look at a four day week, to look at different ways of managing that link between work um, and time out in family, time to renew our brains, time to renew our bodies. And the final goal, the seventh goal, is a globally responsible Wales, a nation which when doing anything to improve the economic, social, environmental and cultural well-being of Wales, takes account of whether doing such a thing may make a positive contribution to global well-being and the capacity to adapt to change, for example, climate change. So the whole of the what is framed in the context of climate change. But because there are individual goals that need to be thought of as an integrated whole, a jigsaw of activity to deliver on economic, social, environment and cultural well-being, and that cultural well-being is so important in changing behaviour, now there is a what. People know what they're trying to achieve. Every single department of Welsh Government has obligations to deliver on as many of these goals as possible. And the how is through what we call five ways of working, also outlined in the Act, the mechanism for delivery. There is a requirement on public services in Wales and the government to think long term, to be preventative, to integrate those goals, to collaborate with other organisations in terms of delivery and very importantly, to involve people about whom decisions are being made in the decisions. And what you see in those goals and ways of working is a direct translation of all the ways in which the National Assembly for Wales and then the Welsh Government and now the Parliament in Wales, the Senedd, to give it its Welsh name, has wanted to deliver on this agenda over the last 20 years. It's been a really long journey, but the journey that we took here in Wales, I hope is a journey that will be of help to others who also want to put future generations at the heart of their policy thinking, at the heart of their laws, in terms of how they act as a country to protect the interests of current and future generations alongside each other. I mean, I think what, one of the questions that people often ask me um, is why I wanted to create a law. And I think what's been really interesting as somebody who spent my life working in policy and law is that policy, policy is good for a time and every politician in the world <laughs> will come into their political post with ideas about policies. But policies don't endure unless they get turned into law. And I think that my journey in the context of having a duty to promote sustainable development in law but a really difficult duty on which to deliver because it wasn't defined in law meant that I became much clearer over my political journey, having spent 12 years in government, to understanding that a law that's going to deliver on something so fundamentally different in terms of the way in which law operates, that it has to have be very, very clear in its intention. And if we think about the fact that there are huge networks, governmental networks across the world that commit, but it turns out they're committing short of a law. Because what I was really shocked to find is that Wales is still the only country that has put the protection of future generations into law. But I think somehow that concept of protecting future generations is an incredibly popular one. And when I talk to other people about whether or not it could work in other countries, I talk about it in the context of finding their own way 
in their own culture and environment. Because this is a Welsh law in a Welsh environment in the country of Wales, created by the people of Wales, for the people of Wales, enacted by government uh, and the legislature of the people of Wales. But in the way it is framed, it wouldn't necessarily work in a larger country in the same way. And the cultural aspects of it wouldn't work in a different country in the same way. But I think that if we all think about the wicked problems that we've seen in the last year, if we look at COVID, if we look at climate, if we look at Black Lives Matter and the equality agenda, actually having a law like the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in Wales provides a values framework that could deal with all of them. And I think it's the values framework that actually is the really important opportunity in other countries. We know there's interest in other parts of the UK. Scotland is particularly interested in the experience of this law in Wales. We know that there are those who are putting propositions to have a similar law across the whole of the UK. We know there's interest in, in other countries, particularly small countries. Um, five countries have banded together in a wellbeing economy alliance, um, which includes New Zealand, Iceland, uh, Scotland, uh, Wales, for example. And those countries are particularly interested in focusing on new ways of looking at economics. So it may be that people are using different language for the same agenda. But a really important aspect of this law is that this law does not have compliance as a key point within it. And some people find the idea of a law without compliance uh, or, or without punitive compliance. Basically, you're not going to go to prison <laughs> if you break the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Um, and some people find that really hard to think about a law that is challengeable in the courts, but will not have a traditional punitive outcome. But for me, it was really important that if you're going to propose a values framework to the nation, that actually that values framework is not punitive. It actually is the permission to think differently. It's the permission to imagine the what if. What if we did it this way? And the really exciting thing for me at this point in time is that there are due to be elections in May. And I've already seen some of the manifestos that civil society um, uh, is proposing to the different political parties in Wales. And they're nearly all predicated on the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And it's so exciting seeing totally new ways of delivering agriculture in Wales at, uh, using an agroecological approach whereby we do grow food in Wales for the people of Wales. And this isn't a vegan agenda. This will keep bovines in the mix, um, but it will also benefit Wales ecologically, um, for example. And if we just think about new kinds of economy which support smaller businesses linked to activities uh, that are supported by the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, if we think of moving away from fossil fuels. I mean, Cardiff does have an airport um, and there are a couple of other small airports in Wales. Could Wales actually be right at the heart of developing alternative fuels for planes as the steel industry is currently looking at? So having been the largest um, place for the steel industry in the UK, is it going to be the big opportunity for alternative fuels for, air, for aircraft and therefore moving one of the biggest fossil fuel polluters on the planet? There are so many ways in which innovation in a small country can actually deliver really big outcomes and is so important. Here in the UK, my generation, the baby boomers, is the richest generation of all time. And that's discounting those billionaires who have profiteered on the back of the fossil fuel industry, who have profiteered on the back of the kind of nepotistic politics that we've seen, particularly in nations led by populists. 
But my children's generation is set to be the poorest generation. And the reason I say that is they will be the first generation who are poorer than their parents. And that is a feature of the developed world. And they're poorer than their parents because our generation has delivered our problems onto their generation. So we haven't solved the problems of nuclear waste. We've sent that down the line and all the costs attached. COVID, this huge pandemic covering the world at the moment, my generation won't pay the costs of COVID, or certainly not under the government we have in the UK at the moment. It will be future generations uh, who will pay that cost. So already all those young people who are losing jobs because of COVID, hitting the 16 to 24 year olds more than any other generation, they are already paying university fees back. They're already not getting access to their first job and they are going to be paying the costs of COVID for the longest period of time. They're already going to have to work into their 70s before they access a pension when my generation uh, could mostly retire at 60. We are talking about dramatic negative changes on that generation and that's before we even start talking about climate. So I think we have a moral obligation, those of us who have benefited from a visionary generation, the one before ours. My parents' generation was the one who went through World War II. My parents' generation was the one who supported the idea of housing fit for all, education fit for all, a health service fit for all, that kind of vision and apply it across the world in the terms of ensuring that future generations are looked after. But the point of thinking about future generations and factoring them into legislative and policy thinking is it immediately changes your value framework. You're not thinking about how to reward your friends tomorrow. You're not thinking about making decisions today for tomorrow. You're thinking about making decisions today for people who you may not even be alive to know. And that, that is the kind of thinking that we all need to demonstrate if we're gonna tackle climate effectively in the interests of all of us. So I hope that people will be interested in reading the book. <laughs>